Okay, this is going to be the last video before 2020. I do think we kind of got gypped a bit. I mean, still no flying cars. You know, the Blade Runner future is just not here. But that aside, um, you know, 2019 has been a pretty uh, both difficult and rewarding year. So um, a lot of stuff uh, happened, I guess. But, you know, most years are pretty busy in my life. But 2019 was, uh, was yeah, both tough and good. Uh, so that's okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the type of people that are on my channel, which I appreciate quite a lot. So I wanted to thank you guys for being here. And the fact that, you know, gammas just go directly to the gamma mass graves without further ado. And that there are quite a few of you here that are, for the most part, dialectic thinkers, which is good. And I wanted to clarify that, in that I don't appreciate, care, or really try and indulge at all rhetorical thinkers, um, sophists, generally people who, you know, don't fare well with the truth. And the little thumbnail that I've put, which is, you know, a tanto, a, um, a wakijashi, and a katana, <laughs> has, you know, truth, fact, and dialectic, um, you know, uh, sorry, facts, logic, and dialectic sort of equals truth. Um, and it is quite correct in that if you're able to take in information and change your mind, then you're the type of person that I think is reasonable and normal. If you're the type of person who unfortunately gets uh, controlled purely mostly by your emotions you're not really anybody I want to hang around too much with now all of us do get swayed by our emotions to some extent or other in different circumstances and so on but the <clears throat> but the general thing thing here is how do you react to absolutely factual information uh, that perhaps goes against what you do feel or what you do like or what you do believe. And um, this is very important for Catholics, uh, well, for everybody, I think, in, in general. But again, you know, the Catholic Church has been wise enough to um, sort of put down in writing most of its rules um, in terms of canon law and what exactly um, you know, how the dogma of the church is applied is what canon law is. And that's quite important because there are things in canon law that you might not agree with. In fact, I doubt that any single person um, agrees with every single uh, piece of canon law. And yet, overall, if you apply those rules, you end up with a pretty uh, amazing society which, you know, seems to, um, would, would seem logically to uh, indicate that indeed the, the Catholic Church is supernaturally protected and the magisterium of the Church is in fact correct and supernaturally arrived at to some degree or other, though done by human action. And it's very important because, you know, for example, there is a... Um, one of the canons of, of uh, the Catholic Church is that you're not allowed to duel. Um, the ca Catholic Church imposed this because in France it would be, it had become sport practically to duel to the death for the slightest of offenses. <clears throat> Thousands of people lost their lives for meaningless insults. And um, as a result, the Catholic Church sort of said, no, uh, if you're Catholic, you can't duel. Um, which personally is a rule I don't really like, but it makes sense. It does create a better society and so on. Now, you know, it was specifically put in place to protect against uh, dueling to the death and so on. I don't know that necessarily, you know, I don't know exactly what the position of the church is on a duel that would be... Um, not to the death, but I assume it would still be very much frowned upon because ultimately it would be seen as a matter of pride. 
which in most cases it would be. Um, and as such, kind of a stupid thing to get involved in. That said, there are times when a challenge needs to be answered or issued. And it doesn't necessarily have to do anything with personal pride. Um, you know, there are instances where you have to respond. So that's just how it is. Um, which brings me, of course, to what I call 3D thinking or paradoxical thinking as opposed to 2D thinking or binary thinking, which is very much a Protestant thing. Now, because of the language that we commonly share, which is English, um, there are unfortunately very much embedded both in the language and in the sort of um, thought patterns of the Anglo-Saxon world, there are quite a few puritanical, Protestant-inspired ways of seeing things and of thinking and of believing, which are not prevalent in the Romantic languages, which have always been Catholic. And, you know, if, if you want an example of this, I strongly suggest uh, that you get and read a book called The Cloud of Unknowing. But if you really want to appreciate the change in thinking, get the book The Cloud of Unknowing um, on, on Amazon or whatever. The Penguin translation is the best one. So get that one, which is translated into modern English. But the original is available online, free as a PDF file. Uh, print it out, because the original is in what they call Middle English, I believe, which is, you know, uh, The Cloud of Unknowing was written anonymously by some kind of a monk, apparently, in the, I think it was the 13th or the 14th century, 13th century, I think, something like that. And it's an amazing little book. It's truly wonderful. Um, but you can appreciate the language a lot more if you compare the modern English version with the original Middle English, because you will see in the Middle English, the language used, although, you know, also the spelling is a little bit different here and there, but they use the language in a much richer fashion, in a, in a much more interesting way. And there you can see, you know, in the 13th or 14th century, whatever it was, um, I don't remember the date, I think it was written in 1300 something or early 1300s. At the time, of course, um, England, the whole of the United Kingdom, which wasn't united at the time yet, but the whole of England, of course, was Catholic because there was only Catholics and, you know, those uh, backstabbing Orthodox back in, you know, the, the East. But England was, of course, Catholic. And you can see in the way of writing, in the way the language was used, a much uh, more rich language, a, a language that is far more uh, imbibed with human concepts, with human emotions, I would dare say, in a very intelligent uh, way. And that is fundamentally uh, very much a Catholic concept. If you ever speak, if you ever come across a really, you know, a, an actual Catholic as opposed to Novus Orco priest, and you have a, a deep conversation with them, they are phenomenal, phenomenal thinkers. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth today. I haven't been drinking or anything, but you know, they're really astonishing thinkers. They, um, they have a very witty mind, very humorous, uh, joy-filled, I would say, and deep, you know, penetrating in its um, analysis of the most minute sort of concept that you might just wash over, and they will point it out. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's really quite a, an interesting way of thinking. And I think it's an important way for the English-speaking world to recover because the English language is brilliant in that it becomes, um, it's extremely useful as a learning tool, as a textbook type uh, language. It's the language of learning. You can be extremely methodical in the English language. You can explain something very clearly, very distinctly. There is a word for almost every action, for every type of thing. Um, so it's an instructive language that is extremely useful for very practical purposes. But to a certain extent, that also mechanizes it and mechanizes the people that use it. While 
Italian, for example, I'm, I'm certain doesn't have anywhere near the amount of vocabulary that the English language does. I mean, as a case in point, I've got, you know, the Oxford English Dictionary, the, the, the brilliant books that my wife got me for my 50th, and there's 13 volumes, you know, A through Z, and then there's an additional one, a supplement one. So, you know, there are definitely a lot of words in the English language, while in Italian, you know, we've we've got, I don't know, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a lot less words. And so our language tends to be a lot more ambiguous in certain ways. And yet somebody who speaks proper Italian can write an extremely intelligent, extremely witty, um, very clear uh, document that imparts a humanity that just isn't really as present in most uh, English language uh, works. Um, and if you want an example of that, if you can read Italian and English, uh, I suggest you read a brief description of the Novus Ordo Mass at uh, found at sodalitiumpianum.com. It's uh, and read the original Italian. It's, it's a brilliant piece of work. But anyway, my point coming back to the original thing about um, you know dialectical thinking is that facts, logic, an objective view of reality is extremely important for you to have if you're going to be any kind of a thinker, any kind of a person that achieves things in life. It's very important. Rhetoric is useful in convincing you know, or moving, let's say, the, the zombie masses. And I am uh, I'm actually quite adept at using rhetoric, mostly to piss people off. Um, I have a, a, an innate skill at it. <laughs> I, I, uh, I can't say I ever worked at it consciously, but uh, it's something that I just, um, I don't know, I've, I've got that kind of a brain that picks up on, you know, weaknesses and soft spots and whatever, and I can immediately say something that will, you know, get the whole room up in arms, especially if it's filled with, um, you know, feminists or, you know, people that are not that um, clued up on how to deal with reality. And, um, you know, I, I can't say that that's a very... Um, necessarily a very useful skill to have. Uh, it has its uses. It definitely has its uses, mostly for my own amusement. But, um, you know, it can prove points in a manner that is both uh, so shocking and in your face that people don't forget. And even though they won't admit it, uh, the people who do get shivved by my rhetoric years down the line, you know, that seed has been planted so deeply that years down the line, it does change them. It does move their opinion. Um, and I've had a several few people, you know, come back to me years later and sort of say, yeah, you know, you're kind of an asshole. You're a bit of a bastard. I really didn't like the way you talked to me at the time. But I got to admit, you know, and then comes their little confession. So it does have its uses. Um, those of you who've read uh, my little book, Believe, will understand what I'm going on about. But by and large, th those are the kind of people that I want here, you know, people that are able to use facts and logic to think, you know, I've had just the last couple of comments um, were just kind of case in point. One guy wrote, the earth is flat, you know, that's it. That was his whole comment to which I said, uh, no, it's not, but your imagination sure is. And then he responded to that. He's like, I'll pray for your enlightenment. I'm like, dude, you're better off just taking elementary mathematics and, you know, buying a telescope. But, you know, that's what it is. And another guy, of course, uh, commented that uh, Christmas didn't exist be before World War I or II. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, how stupid are these people? You know, not that I trust Google, of course, but even Google can't hide the fact that Christmas has been around there quite a bit longer than just World War I, you know? But that's it. You know, these guys either get raised in a Jehovah's Witness cult or a Mormon cult or Protestant cult of some denomination. They get told some crappy nonsense and that's it. That's what stays in their head. That's why it's very important to to read uh, widely 
and also deeply you know especially history um, like the history of the Crusades if you if you read a book like uh, Harold Lamb's um, the Crusades of Iron Men and Saints which you can get on Kindle quite easily it's harder to get a, um, a paper copy because it's an old book but brilliantly researched you know it gives you the source documents that are referred to or if you read pretty much anything by Rodney Stark you know that guy is a historian with a buck up his butt about being correct and he names other academics who are not honest or who try to you know present their narrative just to push their narrative rather than look at the facts and guys like that are, are awesome you know you you it's important to read the real history of what happened um, I did a video not too long ago on uh, Captain Orellana and the discovery of the Amazon and if you go to the original source documents in Spanish written you know about these guys that just sailed down the, the Amazon and met all these tribes and fought and rebuilt their boats you know just an amazing story I mean it would make a fantastic film um, of course most people would think it's nonsense what happened there but it isn't it's absolutely you know factual and it got recorded at the time by the people who were on that trip um the guy who did so lost an eye he was a priest and you know it's just the, the toughness of the of the spanish conquistadors is also mentioned in hammond ein's book the conquistadors which is a brilliant book i suggest you all read it um you know these guys are like taking on massive wounds and it's just like a one line sort of oh yeah pedro lost his left arm today you know and then like maybe a week later pedro died of cangrene he couldn't hack it you know <laughs> it's like but jose who lost his leg is still fine we've built him a stump and he's going now he's fighting with us and three weeks later you know jose fought well today and killed 17 aztecs you know it's just like what <laughs> Or this wasn't the guy missing a leg you know they're, they're just really tough people and similarly with the book the crusades so it goes to show that like our ancestors were far from the pussified idiots that you think they were why is history extremely important especially catholic history because you haven't seen any everything that you know about catholicism has been on tv on the radio on films on books that you've read and unless you're eight years old you've never experienced a real Catholicism as an adult most likely and everything that you know about the Catholic Church is a lie and the lies about Catholicism have been going on since the Protestants and before them too but you know they intensified certainly since the Protestants started uh, 500 years ago and um, it's very important to understand what the origin what the original Catholic beliefs were what the original Catholic dogma entailed what original Catholic behavior meant you know who were these people what did they actually do and if you look again the Crusades the Knights of Malta those 40 guys who took back a Sicilian city from Arabs and you know they were just going back home they were pilgrims returning home and decided nah we can't have this took the city back gave the weapons and armor back that they'd been loaned refused payment and carried on walking back home I mean you know those are men those are real men that did real things and changed the world for the better you know it's Catholics that essentially did away with slavery all sorts of things you know although in um, in the Bible you know slavery is, is like well if you're a slave try and be a good slave you know because we know human beings are corrupt bent and whatever so these things are important especially for those of you who do want to delve a little bit deeper I told you that in 2020 we're gonna have some um, some other stuff coming out there's gonna be um, I'm not gonna spoil it for you but there's gonna be a couple of books and hopefully a documentary as well that are all gonna be coming out on the Catholic Church or related topics that I hope will do well um, in spreading the word in spreading the truth I was really very pleasantly surprised and I have to thank all of you for the um, the way that belief that little book was received you know it's been uh, awesome I keep getting emails of people that are converting people that are getting baptized people that are returning to the true church people that are saying thank you for opening my eyes I was wondering what the hell was going on with my church and I realized oh that isn't my church 
that's a deceiving Novus Orca church. My church is over here and I found it again now. Thank you very much. And, you know, there is some people that think, oh, well, you know, the, the, the Catholic church that you, you know, you said deprivationists talk about is nonsense because uh, the Catholic church has to be visible. It is visible, <laughs> but you have to look, you know. And God is well known throughout the Bible. There are many examples of this in the Bible where if you choose to be ignorant, if you choose to ignore things, if you choose to not pay any attention to the stuff that is important, God gives you over to your perversions, you know. And it's not limited to just, you know, homosexuals and, and sexual deviants of whatever nature. No, it's for everything. You know, if you decide that you're going to be a hedonist and ignore the church, ignore God, ignore the very concept of theology, ignore the very idea of God because I, I, don't, I don't want to think about it. Well, guess what? You've got free will. You can live in the cesspit, in the, in the sewer, if you want to, because you don't want to look up. Nobody's going to tell you that you can't. And another thing, you know, that, that there are so many lies that Protestants have spread about Catholics and that, um, you know, one of the morons on <laughs> that little group I belong to was going on about how the Catholic Church had brothels that were all lined up and they, they were officialized and blah, blah, blah. And again, five minutes on the Internet will prove to you that that is just absolute bullshit and that you know, there, yes, there have been corrupt parishes, there have been corrupt bishops, there have been corrupt priests. So what? That's happened everywhere. But, you know, to, to, to state that, that the Catholic Church had an official position on prostitution that was to have brothels in, um, in nunneries and seminaries and whatever, and I'm talking about the old the actual Catholic Church, not the... Um, not the Novus Orca ones, which wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, their, their seminaries are basically bathhouses. Uh, although I don't think there's any female prostitutes anywhere near there because it's a bunch of sodomites. But anyway, um, you know, the, the, the nonsense, the lies has been perpetrated for so long and even in the way that language is used that it's quite difficult for people to understand the beauty of Catholicism. Um, Immortal Bear, however, a while back, actually, he, he wrote to me and he said, you know, it's amazing. I'm reading through catechism books pre-1958. Um, and, oh man, it's all making so much sense. Everything is connecting and I, I can't believe that I didn't know all of this stuff. And, you know, I'm the same. I'm no different from anybody else in that regard. You know, I, I still get amazed and surprised and pleasantly surprised every time I pick up the catechism book of uh, Carlo Dragone, which is only in Italian as far as I know, but beautiful book. Or, you know, when I read the Bible and, and try and sort of go a little bit deeper than normal, or when I have my, you know, hour-long conversations with my priest about all sorts of things. And it's amazing, you know, your, your Catholic priests are surprising. They're surprising people. They're... Um, you know, you sort of think, oh, well, yeah, I have to be, you know, like I should sort of watch my, my, my mouth and say what I'm going to say. And of course, I don't because I say what I'm thinking, you know, and I tell the truth. What's the point of lying to, to my priest, right? And I'm not talking about confession. I'm just talking in general. Why would I lie to the guy? He's there. Is it? And, you know, these guys are, you know, they're very, very intelligent people and very well educated, very well read. They understand the intricacies of the human heart probably better than most human beings I've met. Um, and have something wise to say on pretty much any topic. And if and when they don't, they say so. They just say, I, I don't know on that, you know. But um, it's very, very interesting dialectical thought. I mean, you know, I discussed, for example, the death penalty with my priest, and it was we were so much on the same page. I was like, "Huh?" Because uh, you know, we talked about pedophiles, for example, and I said, "You know, the death penalty is absolutely needs to be reinstated." And he, said, and he says, "Of course, all the Catholic Church has always believed that." Did you take a life? You know, you pay for a life. And I said, "Well, I'm not just for that. I'm also the ones that rape kids. You know, those guys destroy lives. And as far as I'm concerned, a shallow ditch somewhere by the side of the road is is more than they deserve." And the, the priest's statement was, well, yes, those people do need to be removed from society. <laughs> you know, it's just like, that's why you're my priest. <laughs> you know, he really is a battle priest. And, and that, 
And it's not because it's him exclusively, it's because that is Catholic teaching, you know. So you need to understand that. It's not like, you know, if you if you think that the Catholic Church is those like churches that you see going into the Bergoglian, you know, satanic houses, those are not Catholics. Those are people that have been deceived and fooled and think that, oh, you have to sing Kumbaya and hold hands. You know, no, that's not really what Catholicism about is about. Catholicism is about spreading the truth. And if, you know, the only way you can spread light sometimes is to set fire to enemy encampments. It's just how it works. You know, metaphorically, hopefully, um, but occasionally when there's a just war on, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's physical too, you know. So you gotta, you gotta appreciate that. And dialectical thinking, which is based on objective facts, logic, you know, verified information, information that you can test and see. It doesn't matter if you like it. There's a whole bunch of information I don't like about how the world works, the most of it, in fact. But that's not the point. It's not about whether you enjoy it. It's not about whether you're having fun reading it. It's not about whether you personally like it or agree with it. Is it true? Is it factual? And, you know, if the preponderance of evidence is that, yes, it is, well, then you have to accept that and work accordingly. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it doesn't even matter if you're a Christian or Catholic or a believer. If Catholic theology, if Catholic thought provides for a better model for life and produces better results than another system, why on earth would you not use it? Let's say you're an atheist. Let's say you don't believe in God at all. But if acting as if, right, the Catholic belief system is entirely correct, produces a happier, healthier, more prolific and um, joyous life, why would you not follow it? And for those of you that are saying, but climate change and too many children and shut the fuck up. Listen to what I just said. Go investigate the facts. Climate change is an outrageous lie perpetrated mostly by one egregious liar and it's been proven falsified. That 97% of scientists agree with climate change is bullshit. Now, if you're going to tell me that 97% of, sci of scientists are frauds, I'm more likely to believe that. But, um, you know, never mind belief. Go check at the facts. Go look at the data. Go look at the raw data. They falsify data to try and get that hockey stick about global warming. It's bullshit. And the guy who did it, whose name escapes me for the moment, but, you know, he's, um, he's an absolute fraud. He was sued and he lost. Uh, he was sued by Mark Stain, I believe. And uh, he absolutely lost. And, you know, there's, I think there's an appeal or whatever, but it's it's fraud. It's absolute fraud. I've known this for years. On top of which, in 2020, the four phases of the sun go offline, pretty much. They all go out of phase and uh, the magnetic fields of the, of the sun. So it's probably going to be a massive ice age coming, if anything, not global warming. And look at the predictions of climate change and global warming that have been going on since the 70s. Huh? I was around in the 70s. I was young, but I remember the crisis. We were going to run out of oil in just a few years. We weren't going to get to the end of the 70s with any oil left. Well, guess what? It's 40 years later, still plenty of oil all over the place. Hell, they're killing each other over it. Americans are bombing the crap out of everybody to try and get even more. So we're out of oil? When did that happen? It didn't. Neither did any of the other you know, multiple death scenarios that, that we were told at school to try and terrify you. It's all lies. So look into things for yourself. Use your own brain. You know, I know that, look, reality is a lot stranger than you think. And when you start to think for yourself a little bit and you start to look into things, don't come at me with fucking flat earth bullshit, all right? If you think that, you're stupid. You're just stupid. There's no other word for it. The ancient Greeks could figure out that the earth was a globe. So why can't you? You've got a lot more advantages technologically and educationally than the average Greek did. All right. So start from first principles. Figure it out. The earth is not flat. 
Oh, and nowhere in the Bible does it say the earth is flat. You're retarded. Okay? If you think that the word firmament in English, like Jesus spoke it, means a snow globe. It doesn't. Firmament is the translation of a Hebrew word that means the expanse. As in the sky. You morons. The earth is not flat. Wakey, wakey. So, but do think for yourself. Do, you know, I'm, I'm putting together, I've nearly done it. You know, I've been threatening to do this for years. I just never had the time. But I've nearly put together a list of 100 books that I think everybody should read. Some are fiction, some are not fiction. It's just books that I remember and off the top of my head, you know, the ones that made most of an impact. And I'm at 83, and that's just straight out of memory. You know, that's not even... Um, that's not me looking around or thinking about it. These are just books I've personally read that um, I found very interesting and that I think, um, you know, are, are, are something worthwhile, put it that way. Um, I've got to clean it up. Like I said, I've got another what, 17 books to titles to add to it. Um, and once I've done it, I'll probably put it on the blog. And I'm going to try and separate it a little bit into fiction, non-fiction, history, science, whatever, you know. But, um, yeah, so that will hopefully happen soon in the, 2020, in the year 2020. I've updated, of course, the, uh, I, and I will continue to update the whole Jay Dyer debate thing to just keep grinding him into the dirt. And it's amazing how at first, you know, all the internet bum fights are like, you lost, you lost. And now slowly they're all crawling back. So they're like, oh, yeah, you actually kind of squished him. Oh, oh, actually, I didn't realize that's what, oh, oh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, um, I hope that you've had a decent 2019. I hope that you had a good Christmas. And I sincerely wish you a happy new year and a great 2020. Um, there are already some great things in 2020 that we know will happen. I think the God Emperor Trump will be voted in again, probably with a landslide, barring any other weirdness, which is always possible. But um, yeah, I hope that the truth keeps coming out more and more in 2020. And I hope that the real Catholic Church is now continuing to spread and it's getting uh, more and more traction. And we're going to keep pushing for that. We're going to keep helping for that. So keep spreading the word. If you've bought uh, the book Believe and read it and given me a review, and I've, I've seen that um, quite a few of you have, I mean, it's up to like 15 reviews. And I know that most people who read a book, even when they really like it, don't write a review, but that's fine. Um, thank you very much to those of you who have. It's, uh, it's doing very well, and I'm very appreciative of that. And again, thank you for the surprising response to it and how many people have been um, have are having their faith somewhat renewed because of it I'm, I'm pleasantly and happily surprised and uh, humbled by it so thank you very much and have a great 2020